Do it. All right. Tips to giving a dog with bite history a fair life. Structure. You know, everything comes everything comes with structure. I think the biggest mistake people make with dogs that have bite history is they right away want to get the dog out in an environment and then they want people giving the dog treats. Right? That's there's no bigger mistake than a dog that has an issue with people and then people getting in that dog's face, right? So as a trainer, my thing is to decompress the dog. Like everybody around you doesn't even pay attention to you. I love that. They don't yeah. put any pressure on you. And the only person who's going to give you cookies is me. Right. Right. And then after weeks of this, I have people dropping treats. So there's no pressure. I think press, dogs with bite history don't do well with pressure they can't understand, right? The pressure of me not allowing them to interact and pressure of me telling somebody else don't go near the dog makes it fair to the dog. Right. Then I can explain to the dog, you have no reason to bite. But if somebody's getting right in his face, I can't correct the dog because, yeah. you know, I haven't set up a Let's fair structure it. for it's the that dog. Go and get it. With no hesitation. This that never quit. Start that elevation. This that process. This that in the making. What is up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Elevated Canine Podcast. I am here with my co-host, Ro Roel Guerra. Roel Guerra. And today, I am blessed to have my brother, Robert Cabral, here. What's up, Robert? Thanks, How you man. doing? Well, thanks for having me on. Hey, man. Finally. <laughs> finally, we're able to get him. Oh, well, no. You've been talking about it for a long time. I know. I know. Um, first off, man, let's get started with your story. I, I'm, I'm very... Yeah, I, I, I know you and I have talked a little bit. Yeah. And... Uh, and I didn't know a lot of things that you were mentioning. I was like, yo, let's save it for the podcast. Uh -huh. So uh, why don't we start with, you know, when you got down here and your, uh, you know, your whole, your journey. Where, where do you, where do you want to start? I want from the beginning, <laughs> from when, when you got when to L.A. or where, even when you were born. Yeah. Oh, your upbringing. Man. I think a lot of people uh, always wonder about, like, people's upbringing. Yeah. I, I for sure did because just we could get there at some point. But mm -hmm. we were talking about how you did struggle for a certain period of time while you were down here. And to me, it was kind of like, I automatically seeing you, I assume that you have always been somebody mm. who was, you know, successful or, or, you know, you grew up in a certain way. Right. And it wasn't like that. So definitely yeah. that's why I want to hear your story from the beginning. Um, well, I mean, I, I was I was born in America and I was raised in Germany for the first eight years of my life. So I came back to America not speaking the language. So um, I got beat up every single day How old? in school, uh, like eight, nine years old. Got it. And um, lived in Jersey and uh, got beat up, you know, because I was a German guy, couldn't speak the language, didn't know the jokes, didn't know the, you know, the lingo and everything. So um, I was, uh, it was horrible. I hated my life. You know, I, I hated every day of my existence. I went to a Catholic school and just got beat up going to and from school on good days. I just got beat up going one way. And um, my mom put me in martial arts, first thing. You know, I was like nine or 10 years old, and I was in a, a judo class and karate classes and stuff. And um, then we moved. We moved to New, uh, Florida from New Jersey after my uncle died. Because when I, when I lived in Germany, it was my mom, me, my cousin, my aunt, and my grandmother, five of us living in a one-bedroom <laughs> apartment. So, um, and then when we moved to New Jersey, we had to step up and it was my aunt and my uncle and my mom and I living in a two bedroom apartment or two bedroom house. So my mom eventually met, met somebody else. My parents got divorced, um, when I was like two or three and, um, we moved to, uh, we moved to uh, Florida and that was a huge move. I had got first time I had my own room, I was 13 years old, you know, and, um, and, it, you know, it's, I mean, I think life is a struggle. I mean, I think it's that's I, to me, it's just normal. Right. Um, I moved out to California. I mean, I did martial arts and stuff. I came out to California to be a bodyguard. That's that was my first real job in California was bodyguarding and doing security and teaching martial arts back and forth. So how old, how old were you when you came down here? I was 20 years old when I came here. And to um, and the company that I was working for bodyguarding at the time had an apartment set up for me where I could live. And within about, I would say, two months, I was homeless. Oh, dang. Wow. Yeah, I had nowhere to go. Like, the, 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 there's a lock, you know, one of those locks they put on your door and you can't yeah. get in. <laughs> like, you can get out, but you can't get in. <laughs> um, that was on my door. And I'm like, oh, man, I got, you know, my stuff. And I didn't have a lot of stuff. I, when I moved out here, I was in a 1972 Mazda RX-7 with all my possessions. So, but, like, those, that's all I had. Right? right. And they were locked in this Oakwood apartment in Toluca Lake. And so, you know, I got lucky. This girl I'd been dating, we kind of moved in together. And, and um, I stayed with her and, and her friend. And for a while, and then just, you know, circumstances happened, bodyguarding got really busy. And, um, and I, I enjoyed being a bodyguard, although it led me to become the person where I, I just have this 
disdain for fame or Hollywood or you know or wealth or or I should say opulence, not wealth, right? Like people who show off with their money. Um, and you know, man, it's just such a long story to just kind of like narrate on. Right. But um, uh, eventually, I opened a karate school. How old were you when you opened that up? 27. 27. Yeah, so I was um yeah, I was teaching at that point. I was lucky that I had the rank to be able to teach at that at that age and um I started the martial I started the first school I opened was in Switzerland. Came back to the States. I, I was I was going back and forth to Switzerland. I came back to the States and then um I opened a school in Little Tokyo. I was the only Caucasian guy to ever have a school in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles. And which wasn't fun because you know the, the Asians, the Japanese were not fans of me yeah. at that time. Um, <laughs> a reverse racism going yeah. on. Um, but I got through it because the guy who actually, and that's how funny how you know people talk about racism. Like the guy who gave me the shot to have the dojo in uh -huh. Little Tokyo was a Japanese guy. Mm. And then the Japanese martial artists weren't happy that I was there, but I stayed there nonetheless. You right. know, um, some intimidation stuff, but that, that didn't work out very well. So then I went to the sports club Irvine and the sports club LA and uh, started their martial arts program. Is that kind of like a gym or? Yeah, sports club LA was like the premier fitness, you know, where all the, the wealthy Beverly Got Hills it. and stuff was. So, um, so that was my, f I taught there for a year or so, and then um, the owners of the club offered me the space behind the club to open a traditional dojo. And I opened that, and I had that for 11 years, till 2000. Wow, nice. Yeah, so that was my, you know, but then again, during that time, um, I was dating the girl I now marry, Janet, and we broke up, and my life just took a really bad turn, and um, I ended up living on the floor of that school. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. I would literally hide my car around the corner. And you were like at this, I mean, if you were 27 at this point, how old are you? 30, maybe 32. 30. And you're living at the... Yeah, I had nothing. I had no money. I, I had nothing. I was at the bottom, like at the very bottom again, right? Right. It's like, it's like from my childhood all the way up. Um, but I thought it was fine. I, I lived on the floor of the school. I would go to Yoshinoya and get like a big chicken thing for dinner. Yeah. And for breakfast, I'd get egg whites at the Sports Club LA because I got a discount because I was teaching a program. But they didn't know I was living in the dojo, I would have lost that. Then I would have been living in my car. So, wow. Um, and then from there, I just started, you know, trucking back and trying to, you know, yeah. trying to make it. And that's it. Just doing, run, running that class or whatever there until Taught you that. became a dog trainer. Um, I did photography, and then and then I and then, you know I hated that. And um, it's like you know all my hobbies turned into jobs, right? Which you then end up hating. Right. Dog training mm -hmm. is the only thing that was a hobby that I kept my help my friends train their dogs. I learned a little bit, studied a little bit. And um, it's one thing I've done for the, besides martial arts that I still love um, for the longest time in my life. And I still love it. Got it. So let's get into that. The dog training side of it. How how was it? Uh, so your introduction to dog training, what was your first dog that you put hands on or? <sighs> Well, um, well, first dog I put, I mean, my, we had dogs growing up, okay. but we never trained them. You know, they, they were never trained. We had a, a, there was a collie when I was a young boy named Lassie, of course. Um, <laughs> and then we had a, a, a last app, so called Gatsby. And then he got put down. And then, then I didn't have a dog for a long time. And then my buddy, Mike, who was a magician, was like a, a hobby trainer. So he would do like little, you know, 4-H kind of stuff. But he had Dobermans. And so I would always help him with his dogs because he was taking karate classes from me. So he was kind of showing me the basics and stuff like that. Got it. Um, and then I got a Sharpay, and that was like 2003 maybe or something like that. So it was the first time I really trained a dog. And he was perfect. Like this dog could do, I mean, he couldn't do like fancy protection or obedience right. stuff, but, but the dog was bulletproof. He was trained. He was perfectly trained. I'd lay, tell him to lay down, you know, dogs could jump on nothing. And he had never had an aggression. And I got him because he was aggressive from somebody. Really? Um, he was a year old, but it wasn't really aggression. So got but, it. Yeah. So that was my first dog. Silly. Got it. And then after, uh, so after you get that, you start training your friend's dogs, I'm guessing. Right. Yeah. And then let's get into uh, your work with uh, the rescue dogs. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm very intrigued by, by that. I know you, you worked a lot with rescue dogs. Yeah. And so I definitely want to hear about that. Well, that started because um, I was still doing photography, and I thought that the dogs in shelters had, they were screwed. Like, I was living in Nashville, Tennessee back then, and I went into the shelter. I would just, I was felt I was blessed in my life, so I'd buy big bags of food, and I would just drop them off at the, at the shelter in Nashville. And then one day I said, 
I wonder what it's like back there, like in the, in, in the back. Mm -hmm. And I said, can I look in the back? And they were really cool. And they said, yeah, go look. And I would literally like start crying. Like I opened the door and, and Nashville Metro is a nice shelter. It's not like LA. Yeah. You see here, right. <laughs> I mean, it's like clean. And so, um, and so I went in the back and I said, oh, this sucks, man. This is horrible. Right. And I went home and I looked at my dog and I'm like, my dog is loved every day. And these dogs are abandoned for like, mainly for no reason. Right. So I said, I got to change it. Right. And so I started, when I moved back to LA, I went into, I, I sent an email to the guy who's the head of the LA city shelters at Bokes. And I said, you guys got to change the way you're doing things. And I was surprised. He called me to his office and said, what can we do better? I had a pen and paper and I was like, wow, like, uh, how did I get so lucky that this guy would listen to me? Right. And, um, and I said, well, you know, you, you've got to show the dogs better in videos and pictures and stuff like that. And all I would do back then is I had my Sharpay and, you know, I, he was trained and stuff, but I wasn't, I didn't want to be a trainer. I was going into the shelters and I said, well, let's take these dogs out and let me see if I can handle them. Let me see if they'll sit for a treat. Let me see if, um, Hey, let's put some other dogs with them. Let's see what's going to happen. If they messed up, I correct them. I say, hey, don't do that. Don't do mm -hmm. this. And at that point, there was a lot of sharp haze and pit bulls that I was working with and, and, and pulling. And my vet, Dr. Lisa, said, you know, I would bring the dog in for a health check because the dog was going to get adopted. And she said, well, who trained this dog? And I said, nobody. And I bring in another one. She goes, well, who trained this dog? And I said, nobody. And she says, well, you keep telling me nobody, but these dogs are like sharp haze and they're not biting and they're really right. well behaved and they're this and that. And I said, well, I mean, I just kind of like tell them to sit or like, you know, tell them to knock it off if they're being aggressive. She goes, well, you should be a dog trainer. And I said, no, nah, I'm not going to mess up another hobby, you know. Right. And, uh, and then she just people started calling me like, oh, Dr. Lisa said you can help me with my dog. And I was like, oh, man, I, I, I don't really want to do it. Right. What, year, that, Brian, that, what year was this? That would have to be, because I still had my Sharpay, so it would have to be around 2007. Got it. Um, and then I said, you know, then I started the nonprofit Bound Angels, which really went well. And then I ended up putting that program into the L.A. City shelters. Like I would go in there and I would work with dogs and stuff like that. And then the guy, my friend Lewis, who was a big mentor to me, Lewis Dato, who passed away, um, he and I just hit it off. Like we just had the same sense of humor, you know, it's like, like, just like kind of a cop mentality kind mm -hmm. of guy, real down to earth kind of guy. And we would um, laugh about stuff and sh just shoot the breeze. And um, they asked me, the LA city said, would you put in a request for a proposal to do our play groups? And I said, well, I, I mean, I don't, sure. Like, I don't, I don't know what, it, they said an RFP. I said, what's an RFP? They said, it's a request for a proposal. I, I had no idea what that was. Right. I, I had no idea how to even write one. Um, Cause I've never, it's never been good at that business side of it. So I figured it out. I kind of copied what other people had done and I wrote it and I got accepted. So for three plus years, um, I started the very first play groups in the LA city shelters, which comes to find out that was, that's the hardest shelters in the country for some reason. I bet. You know, because of the, the demographic, the type of dogs, the situations, the shelters before they didn't have, they had really crappy shelters like the South Shelter, the, um, the Chesterfield Square Shelter, the, the North Shelter. They were all like just really tough places. And they had really tough dogs. Right. You know, and getting those dogs to get together was a challenge. But um, it would help them. It would help save their lives, but not as much as behavior modification, right? I mean, the, the, the play group thing is a really good sell, and there's a lot of people who really like that, and it looks good. It looks good mm -hmm. on tape. But you, as a, the average adopter, don't care that I can get 17 pit bulls in the yard because you're not going to do it. Right. Right. And they're running and they're jumping and they're smashing into each other. That's just the way the mollishers play. Right. They run, they smash into each other. And we started figuring out early on that we would be kind of breed specific, although not in a negative way. But we would put all the mollishers, the, the pit bulls, the, 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 all these dogs in one group. And they would all play because they knew how to play and we knew how to correct them. Got it. And we really ruled them with an iron fist. You so know? if you had a dog, say, that you know is dog aggressive, you, would, you wouldn't even put them in there no, at all? No, I would okay. you? Yeah. I mean, Got it. Um, what I would do with that dog is I would take that dog separately and work him if there was hope. But the problem in rescue it is and always will be 
uh, the feel good mentality. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So people go, oh, that dog, you know, if only you would take him, you can handle him. Yeah, but I don't want him. Right. Right. I want a nice dog. Um, in a shelter, you have a percentage. Most dogs in the shelter are either nice or relatively uh, moldable. But rescue and feel good people spend their time on the dogs that have killed another dog, that have bit a kid in the face, that are super aggressive because it's the feel good story. Right. Like the dog that's found with three legs and one eye can get adopted a lot faster than a really healthy three year old shepherd mix. Yep. You know, and that's stupid. And even the media, I mean, the, all these organizations play on that. Oh, they'll yeah. put, you know, they'll put the set, the sad song and all that yeah. with that looking. Well, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. Right. I was running my organization, basically funding it myself. And at some point when I got funded, I was working 40 plus hours a week and I never took a salary of more than 2000, <coughs> you know? Wow. So, yeah. So yeah, the feel good problem is the problem in all of dog training. You know that. Yeah. Um, dogs don't um, play with emotions like we do. Um, but, you know, by doing what I did and I caught a lot of guff from people that wanted to do it differently. Um, but we save thousands of dogs. Right. You know, there's no arguing with success. Yeah. And I think you, and, and the dogs you did have, I'm sure you set up the, the new owners for success because I mean, like those feel good stories, it's almost like if they come with a lot of issues, these dogs, and they just throw them out there into sure. regular pet owners yeah. that have no clue what is going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that we had a client recently, I called you about this dog mm -hmm. that was dog aggressive and, uh, she got it from a rescue, and come to find out they like they have had a lot of situations like this where they place dogs that were like real pit bulls yeah. bred for fighting mm -hmm. that they rescued yeah. and these dogs are this dog was like crazy dog aggressive mm -hmm. i mean he uh, he saw a dog and he was like screaming like like how wapo does for bite work mm -hmm. that's how he was screaming for these dogs he wanted to go after them and we just tried yeah. everything and yeah, can't fix and, it. and this no. this uh <laughs> Uh, our client, you know, it's just her with her two kids. And I was like, there's no way we're, mm -hmm. we're going to throw this dog back in there yeah. and we're going to set her up. He, the dog had her was redirecting back on mm -hmm. her. I was like, we're just going to set her up and we're going to set the dog up for yeah, her failure. failure and everybody else. And, uh, and so it's, it's interesting. And, and I, I felt really bad, you know, about tell, letting her know like, Hey, you know what? I don't think we could help you with this dog. Yeah. And, uh, so I could only imagine, you know, but I think the way you're doing it is like you're and, and that's what one thing that I respect about you is and I, and I told you, I wish I could be more like you. And I'm trying to be more like you in, the, in a sense that you don't care and you're going to let them know exactly how it is. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like oh, I don't want to offend people or you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so but I think that especially people that are rescuing need to hear the hard truth of how, how it really is. Yeah, I mean, you, you if you went into the shelter, and I, I used to teach this when I taught at the shelter, I said, find the dog, get not the low-hanging fruit, because a lot of, and I'm not, when I criticize, I'm not criticizing all rescues, but there is a certain demographic of rescues, and I'm not saying culturally, but certain people, they're going to go in and they're going to pick out the low-hanging fruit, right? So when you go to the shelter, you go, okay, that's a purebred golden, that's a purebred lab, that's a purebred German shepherd, and they take those out. Now, German shepherds and stuff like that, okay, I get it. They go to a German shepherd rescue, it's great. But when you pick out the little Maltese, the this one, the that one, this one, and then when you go to the shelter, all you see is pit bulls, old dogs, chihuahuas, and aggressive dogs, right? right? Now the shelter's kind of screwed. Because what you need to do, they had a they had a program, the New Hope program in L.A., where they wouldn't allow a dog to be adopted to a rescue, right? Because they're not rescuing the dog, right? Rescuing is pulling the dog off the street, right. taking it out of the shelter. You know, the, the, some of those dogs, their greatest risk is adoption, right? So they're taking these dogs out, and then they're you know getting it for free from the shelter or for a very low fee, and then they're adopting it or selling it for five hundred bucks, mm -hmm. right? Now some you know, rescues do really good stuff. Like they vet, they put a lot of medical into the dog. They put like, you know, like the guy I had on Kyle on my show, he would put a lot of money into the dog. And there's a, a lot of great rescues to do that. So I'm not talking about that. Right. right? And people got to be a little less sensitive about this kind of stuff. Um, but the people, and they are, they are those. Okay, they get them all. And then, okay, like it's 500 bucks to adopt. Dog, and they're going to do like three home checks and like a financial, right. you know. I mean, that's ridiculous. And they get donations and everything and on they top get, of And tax-free mm -hmm. status and, tax and stuff like that. <laughs> So mm. that's BS, right? Wow. But you've got to be honest with people that there's certain dogs that need to be killed, right? Those dogs are not safe. And it sounds it sounds horrible to it, say it, it like horrible, that. And but it, that's yeah. truth. And it does not feel good when you have to 
put no. a dog down. No. But that's the that's the truth. That's it's not my fault. Right. I didn't yeah. breed the dog. Yeah. I didn't screw up raising the dog. I didn't screw up, you know, putting the dog in these situations. But the people who did that, there's a special place in hell for them. Right? I'm doing the best I can, but I know my limits. Right. And I more than that know another person's limits. So I'm not going to put that dog in the hands of a mother with two kids that's redirecting and the kid's going to get his face torn off. A thousand percent. Right. And I always say, if I tell you that that dog needs to be put down, I'll take it to the vet and do it. Right. Right. I will go with you. Yep. If I trained your dog and I can't do anything with it, because then you're going to have the other trainer who's going to say, well, he didn't try this or he used too much compulsion or he didn't use enough compulsion. Or, it doesn't matter. You know, I know what I know after the experience I have. You know what you yep. know. Um, I'm confident in saying that if I can't fix the dog, probably nobody else is going right. to fix it. Yeah, and and trainers are going to go out of their way to say that they can fix the dog, mm -hmm. and and the person is just going to waste more money mm -hmm. to at the end end up doing probably the same thing again and heartache. But even if you know, let's say somebody can fix the dog. Wait, wait, wait. you're talking about fixing, <clears throat> not not fixing it. Okay, but let's let's say I say, oh, I can do it, and I can do it. But only I can do it. Does that make sense? Like the dog, that's how the dog acts with, with, with me. You. Right. But as soon as I turn it over, that person's not doesn't have the knowledge that I yeah. have to continue. That's not fixed. It's not fixed, right? right? It's I, I can manage, maybe yeah. manage it into a point, you know, that he can live with me. Mm -hmm. But that person yeah. that's going to get the dog back is not going to live the same way. I'm right. not going to have the same structure. Yeah, and I, at, and at the end of the day, you're going to have to set that dog up. I, I had a, a friend who had a Corso, and I knew the lines, and I knew where he came from. And I could tell from a young age, like this dog didn't even need bite work training. He mm -hmm. automatically was going forward mm -hmm. and he actually bit with intent with bad intention. And I was mm -hmm. like, and then he would tell me like, Hey man, like every time, like he, f he feels a certain way. He like, like without even knowing he'll lunge. Yeah. Like if you came from behind and you touched him, mm -hmm. like his first right. reaction is to lunge. Right. right? Back, yeah. And I'm like, I don't care how much desensitizing mm -hmm. we do with this dog. I don't. Anyways, he ended up having the dog. He was like three and a half. And one day, one morning, the dog was sleeping next to the bed. And I think it was the wife or or somebody reached over to pet him. Mm. And whoop, the dog just went off, right? He went crazy and bit. Mm. And I was like, there's no way you could remove that piece no. of that dog. Yeah. Unless you, and, and, I, and like I told him, unless you're going to have him in a dog run. Yeah. And you're going to be the one to feed him and take him out on walks and put him back in the dog run and not give this op this nobody the opportunity to get close to this dog right. if, if that's the way you want to live with this dog mm -hmm. cool yeah have at it but i don't know how you're gonna do like everybody has this idea of their dog they could take them anywhere yeah. they could social you know they could, the dog's gonna be super social some dogs are not that no. yeah. you know people make that mistake all the time though like the two like trainers and there's so many good trainers like i have so many like yourself i have an immense amount of respect for you i think you're amazing thank you um and there's a lot of really good trainers in the world but there is that small group, right, who are just stupid and jerks. So, like, they'll say, well, I'll fix the dog. First of all, you don't fix aggression ever. You know, if it's true aggression, it's managed, mm -hmm. right? right? We manage a dog. It's, it's, not a, it's not a car. You don't replace the spark plug and fix it, right? This is a, a behavior. This is a feeling sentient creature who has a reason for those, those things he's acting out on. So if you say you're going to fix this dog, you're lying. Right. right. It's not, it, you know, you can maybe fix a dog's jump, mm -hmm. you know, or fix a bite like you do mm -hmm. with your, with your competition dogs, but you don't fix a dog that's aggressive, you know? And so now you're going to manage it. Now, who are you going to give that dog to, to manage it? Exactly. And here's a great story. I rem I used to do dangerous dog cases, mm -hmm. right. As an expert witness. And the last case I ever took, there was, a, and it's going to make me probably cry. Um, this, this, guy or no it was, it was a i think i believe it was a woman she had this dog and it got killed um by this other big dog and i was defending the dog that killed the dog and she sat in front of me and she said that dog belonged to my husband and since he died that was that was the only memory i had of my husband and this dog killed Oof. my last memory wow and i defended that dog because i had to and you I defended said, the, 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 the killing dog. Wow. Like that dog got off. And I said, I will never, I vowed that day, I will never defend a dog again that doesn't deserve to be defended. Oof. You know, and it was it was a life changing moment for me. I was like, I won't I took I allowed this dog. That dog should have been killed. It went against your your 
like core. Morals. Yeah. You know, and I, this guy had a story and I went, I said, okay, I'll take the case. And like your defense attorney, you can't just suddenly go, oh yeah, he, he actually did it. You know, you can't do that. Yeah. yeah. It's my, my, my obligation. But on that day I swore and I've had so many people come to me and they said, oh, you can defend this dog. And I said, yeah, but I won't because the dog is, if the dog killed another dog, you shouldn't have that dog. That dog should be killed. Right. You know, I mean, it, you got to control your dogs. I mean, we all have dogs that are very powerful, but we make a commitment to train them and to make them social. And if not, to control them. Right. And if you can't do that, that why should a person, and my father was murdered, you know, I don't believe that if you murdered somebody, you don't get another shot. That's just, that's my core yeah. belief. You know, you mm-hmm. killed somebody on accident, you, you know, you turned a corner of the person. Okay, I get it. That's mo- right. homicide. Or, yeah, manslaughter. I mean, but no, murder. Mm, sorry, they don't get it. Yeah, the other person doesn't get to. Yep. Their family will never see that person again. Right. So, yeah. So it's a tough Man, one. that's tough. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. So, you, uh, so going back to this case, uh, it was kind of like, hey, this is the situation. This is how it happened. And you were kind of like, oh, it was an accident. It was an accident, and the dog went over there and killed him. And I'm I temperament tested the dog. You know, I mean, I've temperament tested hundreds of dogs over my career, mm-hmm. and um, I, and here's the thing with temperament testing. You know this. You can skew it, right? I mean, a dog generally is not going to be aggressive to me, right? Right. I bring a lot. Yeah. Of, I bring a lot of energy to the space, uh-huh. a lot of power. If a dog is going to go off on me, that's a problem, right? right. But. I can play it or I can get a dog to kind of play up on me mm-hmm. or I can, I can put so much, you know, stink eye on that dog. That dog will never come off on me. Yeah. No. And, and, it, and it depends on what, how they're going forward, right? If they're going mm-hmm. forward, like get away from me, mm-hmm. but like dogs that really like will, mm-hmm. will nail you, like yeah. are, are serious. Yeah. Like I, I had a Doberman. I, I think I've talked about it before in the podcast. I had a, a muzzle on him and, he just like muzzle punched me <laughs> so hard right on the chest. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy crap. Yeah, I was yeah. like, this dog is a problem. Yeah. And they have to have him on a on a muzzle the whole time. And, and the guy understands it. He's like, yo, I, I know, I, I know what I have. Yeah. And I mean, and I'm just like, I will never own a dog like like that for yeah. me. Um, so yeah, that's that's tough, man. And and going back to that story of this lady, like, it sucks that she had to go through that yeah. because of this owner that couldn't control their dog, man. That's yeah. One of my greatest pains in my life is that I defended that dog. Wow. Oof. Um, so man, I, this is good. Uh, <laughs> thanks for, I, I didn't know all that about, yeah, well, you know, yeah. of how you're dealing with all the rescue dogs and everything. So, uh, this program that you put together for rescue dogs, right? You went deep into how to, pe- how can people pick the right rescue dog or how, what, what is, what is the, 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 the gist the, of that one. Well, of your the, program. the program I put together, the Bound Angels University, was designed for shelter management staff, volunteers, and trainers to learn how to read dog body language, how to work with dogs, and how to make them ready for adoption. Right. So basically, like one program we did was called the Canine Good Citizen. The AKC Canine Good mm-hmm. Citizen is a fantastic temperament evaluation. Um, I mean, the BH is better. But it's way too intense for the average person. But a, a canine good citizen, anybody can put, put it put it on a dog. Um, and I would teach people. First of all, you got to get a dog out. You got to read that body language. You got to know what you're looking for. People always say, "Oh, the dog is like lunging and his hackles are standing up." Well, that doesn't mean the dog is aggressive, right? Right. If you can't look at the whole dog, you don't get the whole picture. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I really got that from my martial arts background because you could have somebody talking all kind of stuff in your face, and you know this guy's going down really easy. Right. Right. And you can have a guy who's really quiet and you go, I'm never going to mess with that. Right. So um, I brought a lot of my martial arts into the dog training. And that was really my core of my training, because all dog training is, is understanding movement and reading body language. Right. And, and, And working those two together. How can I get you to I taught kids karate really easy. I show you what to do. I lure it. I show it. I do the dog. Um, But the program in the shelter was about taking dogs out of a kennel that you know nothing about, right? And putting a leash on and hoping they don't come up the leash and bite you um, and hoping you can work with them. And then you're limited because um, animal rights people, not animal welfare people, but animal rights people (laughs) would crucify you for putting a correction on a dog, but they can't do anything, right? Those same people who criticized me for putting corrections on the dog were the ones calling me to work with the dogs they were trying to save. Right. So, um, you know, it, this program was very successful in that we had, I mean, I think I had 
more than 200 people go through the program over the that and that's before the, the play groups um after the play group sorry and um it it saved a lot of dogs and then i ended up i put it online i was filming a lot of the stuff for six years i put a program online that 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 does the same thing so if people want to learn that and they, you could that's learn amazing that. yeah um go, going back on shelter dogs i'm it's kind of uh you know i think about the dog right and how he's and actually i think about this with even boarding trains going from a regular house setting now into uh what i feel is something that's not good in the culture of dog training especially like boarding trains mm -hmm. uh where we just uh you know people could just put them in the crate and then they bring them out do a training session put mm -hmm. them back up and the dogs are like stressed out of their mm -hmm. mind it's like a complete sure you know shock to the dog and uh and i feel that we as trainers you can't really see what the dog really is because of how much you change the environment mm -hmm. so and in the first week like the dog like you know they start like i mean if you run it like that i i i'm so happy that we changed the way we were doing things because i've been there i've mm -hmm. ran so i know how it could not be good for the dog to have you know have him in a dog run all day mm -hmm. he's and so shelter dogs they're like in a dog run all day you don't see the best best side of that dog mm -hmm. when you're first going to evaluate this dog right and so it's it's good that you went in there and you can kind of get them out and see something different in the dog and but i just feel so bad for the dogs because yeah we see them at their worst yeah uh you know and and so for people that are out there training dogs right now i i you know encourage you guys to change try to mimic as much as you can how this dog his lifestyle is going to be at home, mm -hmm. you know, and it's hard, mm -hmm. but you know, if you overload yourselves with too many dogs, I just, you know, I'm, I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but don't keep them in dog runs all day yeah. is what I'm saying, because I, I feel for those dogs and same thing for the boarding trains yeah. that come in and pe with these trainers that just keep them locked up all day, yeah. like get them out, start training them. And so was that something that you saw something different in the dogs when you start bringing them out and hanging out and all that? Well, Do you, you yeah. see a big change in the dog. Yeah, you, you, you obviously, like, like one big thing um, you'll see in a shelter is barrier aggression. Yeah. It's one of the number one things keeping dogs from getting adopted. So that means the dog runs up to the front of that kennel and they're just like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I remember my buddy Lewis, who was a, a, um, a Mally, Mal well, Shepherd mix in the West LA shelter. And Lewis and I were buddies. We would always rib each other and stuff. So he said, oh, that dog's really aggressive. And I said, I bet you I can get him out. And he said, how much you want to bet? I said, I'll bet you dinner. And he said, no, nah, man, I, I, that dog, I come to the door. And, and, and Lewis was um, really good friends with, uh, with Dave Reaver. So he was mm -hmm. a very skilled dog man, probably, in my opinion, one of the best dog guys I ever met, could read a dog with like in a minute. Um, and I said, well, I'll take the shot, you know. And so the dog was just coming at the door, coming at the door, coming at the door. And I just opened it and I, I noosed him and I had him out in the yard really quick. And the dog was amazing, right? It was just the barrier aggression. Um, the mistake people make is they end it there, right? So they go up and they go away, they go up and they go away. So it just builds it more and more. Mm -hmm. And volunteers are really trying to do their best, but they're not trained. Like you want to be a volunteer at the shelter, you're going to get trained for like, you know, six hours by somebody who has barely dog knowledge and you can't criticize them for that. It's just, it's not the culture we have. Like, right. It's not, it's like, imagine going to a hospital and somebody has six hours of training and trauma, you know, it's, it's not enough. And so they don't know what to do with the dog and they'll take the dog out in a yard and they'll throw a ball or they'll walk him around the street and the dog is dragging him around the street. So the dog got nothing out of that. Um, what, so my goal was I would take these dogs out in the yard, I'd put them on a long line or on a, on a slip lead and I would start giving them cookies, like getting, getting them to engage. Some engagement. Engagement. That's all. I called it engagement training. And you know, it's not a term I came up with. It's a term that I became well known for using a lot, but the more I could get that dog to engage to me, to look to me, to offer behaviors to me, um, the more likely that dog's going to get adopted because it's going to show that same behavior. I would take that same treat pouch and I'd hand it to the person who wants to adopt the dog. I say, I don't know, go play with him. And the dog would be sitting in front of him and lying down and like, you know, spinning around or doing whatever because the dog was rewarded for that. Right. right? Dogs don't need physical exercise in a shelter environment as much as they need emotional and mental stimulation. That's the mistake people make. They think they need to run them. They need to do this. But dogs are pent up in a kennel. You take them outside and you run them. You get a good risk of tearing a muscle or, you know, or, 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 or other in injuries. So I would say take them out, 
let them do their business and just spend 10 minutes engaging them. And that would, people would watch from, you know, at the West LA shelter, they would be walking by that stop and they'd see these people out there when we did our Bound Age University, they would be standing there watching. They're like, wow, what's going on there? What are they doing? And people would want to adopt those dogs. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, I think, yeah. I'm kind of, I feel, I'm feeling motivated to go hang out at the shelter <laughs> I know, now. I see <laughs> and now I'm like, man, it, yeah. and and yeah, I think, uh, man, that's that's awesome. I yeah, like it. Was, it was fun. Yeah, and so, uh, so from there, obviously your uh, your online stuff, you know, kind of took off, mm-hmm. and then, um, so let's let's go with that. How's how's all that, you know, going right now? It's uh, great. What what are some of the biggest issues or questions that you're getting from people? That you know issues that they're having with their dogs. Oh, I was just—I think it's always the same thing, you know, the leash walking. You know, <laughs> it's the first I, thing that popped into my head. Right, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just—I think people. I—I—I'll I, tell you what. I think people have way too much, too much, too high of expectations of a dog, right? It's a dog, and you expect to put nothing in and get everything out. So I always use the piggy bank analogy, right? So when I first get a dog, all I do is I give him food. I give him a, t- you know, I, I just I give him give 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 give. So that that one moment when I need to pop that leash, that's a big withdrawal, right? So if I've made enough deposits, I've engaged the dog enough, I've given the dog enough chance to succeed, to learn, to, to do what I wanted to do, then I can start making withdrawals. But people right away get a dog on a leash and they're yanking the dog yeah. and popping the dog and doing this. Um, now, even in the shelter, when I would take a dog out of a kennel, the first thing I would do is I would put a treat in through the bars so the dog was like, hey, like, you know, see this? This is an offering a piece. Right. Like, this is how we're going to start the relationship out. And as soon as I get him out, I give him a pet, give him another cookie, and then I get him in the yard, and I give him another cookie. So now, after those three or four deposits, I kind of expect the dog to pay attention to me. And now I can do long line work, right? Mm-hmm. I can start walking away, and, and I'm correcting the dog at 10, 12 feet. And the dog is never associating the correction with me because it's 12 feet away. But when he gets to me, he's getting cookies, getting praise, getting affection, getting whatever. Um, and he walk away and another correction would come. So, you know, those skills. And again, I didn't want to do an online core a, a membership section like mm-hmm. I did. It kind of grew organically because everybody said I would get these calls and say, people say, well, how, how I can't train my dog, you know, but I'm far away. And this and I was like, well, you know, I'll do, I'll, let me do like. 10 quick videos on how I would train a dog. And I did it with Goofy. And um, I just put them on YouTube for free. You know? And I was like, well, nobody's going to want to watch those. And they did. And then people said, well, you can do more. But then I thought, how many different ways can I teach a dog to right. sit or down or whatever? Um, but people wanted to see more. So then I started the membership section. And I thought, you know, I get more good comments from people that have watched either my membership stuff or my free YouTube stuff than people who have worked directly with me because people who work directly with you, they get spoiled, Mm -hmm. right? They see you do it and then they go, well, we'll do it again, right? Well, it doesn't (laughs) matter that I can get your dog to do this. Um, And that's, I think dog trainers make a huge mistake that they show what they can do with the dog, Mm -hmm. but that, that, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. He's not my dog. Right. I don't want like, you know, how many times you see a dog trainer correct a dog for going back to the owner? Like yeah. they're trying to engage the dog. And, and then they'll the correct dog, the dog. Yeah, yeah, the dog goes back to the owner and then they go, I know. And I'm thinking, <laughs> how, how dumb can you possibly yeah. be? Like if a dog goes away from me and back to the owner, that's good. good. That's, yeah. it, it's working. Like that's what I want. Right. You know, so, um, you know, uh, barring the dogs have resource issues and stuff like that with with a person. But, um, but yeah, I think online training, is it's, it's important. I know you talked about this and, you know, other people talk about it online, how it's, it's not a replacement for in-person training, but it doesn't need to be. <laughs> I've had people come that take your course or other courses and I'm just like, your dog's trained. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you're good. And there's like, Oh yeah, I just want to see if I could add something. I was like, all right, cool. Let's hang out. Let's play with the dog or whatever. Right. But, uh, and it's, it's amazing what, what can be accomplished. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one of us, one of our clients had a Rogan's litter mate, Malinois, super aggressive dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he was a nice dog, but yeah. definitely had some aggression in there. And, uh, and dude, he was doing all kinds of stuff with his dog, you know? And right. I'm just like, where'd you learn, bro? Like, teach me. Yeah. And he's like, you know, he's, he was good. He's like, oh, I, yeah, I was watching Robert and, you know, and then I heard about you. So I came out, I'm just like, man, yeah. like that, that's the type of person I want to work yeah. with, you know, people that are motivated mm-hmm. like that. Uh, but, uh, anyways, un- there was another thing I wanted to, to talk about real quick too. 
uh, regarding the <coughs> the shelter dogs and all that stuff, you know, um, do you feel like, you know, stress on dogs is beneficial to the dog? Like adding, like teaching them how to deal with stress. Yeah. Uh, do, and, and, you know, and how do you, how do you talk to people that are against that? You know, like people, I, I get hit up all the time. Like, why are you putting the dog through that mm-hmm. when you could basically avoid it? You know, what, what do you, what do you tell people like when, when they come with to you with that type of stuff? Well, the world can't exist without stress, right? It was, it was stress that created the universe. It was an explosion that created the universe. So if you put a dog in stress, which, which by the way, by, by taking all stress away, you create an immense amount of stress because there is stress in the world, right? The company is going to cut you off on the, on the road and people don't deal with stress. Well, those are the ones who are like, you know, going postal and shooting people in road rage, putting a dog in a stressful situation and teaching a dog how to deal with it is no different than taking a kid into a karate class and, and punching him with a, with a glove and teaching them to block. Mm. If you don't teach your dog or child how to deal with stress, you're committing the greatest form of mental abuse because you need to know how to deal with it. Mm. You you need to know that stress (laughs) exists in the world. In a real world, there's stress every single day. And if you can't handle that stress, um, you got bigger problems than I can help you with. Yeah, no, and and then from that, I wanted to, I do want to touch on this. Uh, I was uh, listening to uh, Susan Garrett was doing a podcast with uh, with Ivan, and she mentioned there like, you know, the way I like, kind of like the way she grew up was kind of like there was never any punish. Like you know, mm-hmm. she didn't, she wasn't getting her butt whooped or nothing like mm-hmm. that. And do you feel like our upbringing molds the way that we train dogs? Do you th- do you think that that has anything to do mm. with the way that you train dogs? Yeah, I, I do. I do really believe that. It's a really great question, by the way. Um, I think people who don't have life experiences don't really know how to share life experiences. Like, you grew up in a tough neighborhood. You had a tough mm-hmm. life. I grew up, um, you know, in I, I've been in very tough situations in my life. Um but it kind of made me who I am. Like if I would have been raised on a, you know, you know, in a really rich area town and never seen poverty and never seen crime and anything like that, then I would think there's just, it's this utopian world. Right. You know, and I would rather, like if I had a child, I would want to put my kid in public school and have him have normal friends, like not, and I've got nothing against wealthy people. And a lot of friends of mine are very, very wealthy, but I don't think it's reality if it's not balanced, right? If you come from the bottom, you go to the top, it's a lot easier than going from the starting at the top and going to the bottom. Yeah. But it's a lot easier to go from the top to the bottom than the other way around, right? It's, it's, it's easy just to lose your footing when you're, you know, on top of the ladder. And I think a lot of people do that and then they don't know how to deal with that stress. But I mean, yeah, I've been almost homeless plenty of times. I've, you know, I remember walking through the Ralph's grocery store and, putting loading stuff in my basket and eating food out of the basket. And then when nobody's looking, I'd leave. That was my meal. You know what I mean? So, wow. um, I understand how to deal with stress and I think it, it's made me a better person mm-hmm. and I'm grateful to the way I was raised. I never wish, Oh man, I wish I would have been raised in Beverly Hills and, you know, had a really nice fancy car as my first man. I'm thankful. So thankful that I wasn't abused like that mentally. Right. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I I thought it was I thought it was interesting. I'm like maybe it, maybe it, the way I that I was brought up did uh, shape the way that you know I'm I train dogs. But but what what do you? But you're not saying that it makes you more abusive. No, than the dog. but but I feel that like for me, I feel like it's beneficial for a dog to go through a stressful situation and come out on top. Right. It uh, and just think about it in protection sports. Mm-hmm. A dog that has been babied his whole life, right? And he, they get him to the high levels mm-hmm. and then they face this guy mm-hmm. that accidentally steps on his paw. Mm-hmm. And now real emotions come into play. Yep. And this dog's like, I want nothing to do with this person. You broke the rules of engagement. I want nothing to do with you. Yeah. And now you're like 
you're done. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to put him through stressful situations in a way where I'm hurting my dog, mm-hmm. but I want him to feel stressed, overcome the stress, mm-hmm. and now he became a better dog right. because he went through that. And I feel it's the same with humans, yep. that if I, I've learned now that owning your own business is mm-hmm. not easy mm-hmm. uh, and when things get hard, I go through stress, right? And I would go into a place where maybe I don't eat as much. <coughs> um, I'm thinking the whole day of the worst thing that can happen, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't function the same way. So I go, I I need to get better at this mm-hmm. or I'm not going to be able to keep running my business the right. way I am. So now I'm like, I need to shift my mentality into putting myself into uncomfortable situations, coming out on top so when push comes to shove i need a and i feel the same way is for the, it's for the dogs for sure yeah, so that's sure. that's why that's why i was I, i'm not trying to say like that we're abusive right i'm just saying i'm more understanding of yeah. what needs to be done in certain cases but you know like the analogy you used okay so like a dog somebody steps you take a protection dog and the dog was never exposed to something else that could happen right guy trips over him the guy steps on his toe or something like that happens you don't he, you know, Frank Phillips said something really great. He said, you know, the, the mistake people make is the dog, they send the dog in the blind and somebody whacks the dog. Well, that's like having a young boy, you know, a 10-year-old boy and putting him up against a 22-year-old MMA guy. Right. Right. You condition the athlete. Steve Stoop said that. You know, you condition the boy to become a man. That's what you're doing. You take the puppy and, you know, I see what you do with your puppies. I mean, you're so fastidious about every little thing. And then... Like when we talked about tracking, right? Like you want some trash on the track. So yeah. that when it happens that, that a, a piece of newspaper blows across the track, it doesn't destroy your track. It right. goes, oh, I've seen that happen before. And you put him through that stress. You've experienced it. But you've you've actually helped him more the way you're training him than the way the, and I'm not criticizing positive only people, but um, the way somebody does who, who removes all adversity right. from life. That's not doing any creature right any favors right i remember a bird you know at some point the mother doesn't teach it to fly it just kind of flicks it out of the yeah. nest you know and it's fly or die right and um you know we're a lot more compassionate than that with our animals when we raise them but um but nature's tough man I it mean, is it's just tough i've seen you know i've seen it in africa and you know with wildlife and everywhere you, life is tough yeah i see uh some uh this dude on youtube this you know, pure positive trainer who you were going at it with. Uh-huh. Uh, he he posted something talking about how, you know, it's proven like that dogs, I mean, that animals anywhere mm-hmm. don't use, you know, positive punishment uh, mm-hmm. to, to fix anything. Right. And then there was a clip of like this monkey <laughs> flicking like poop at somebody and the mom comes the, you know, whatever they call uh-huh. it. She comes with like a bush and just like wax him. Yeah. And he's like, oh, shit. Yeah, and yeah, he goes yeah. away and then right. he, he stops. Right. And you're like that is good the dog is i mean the the monkey was learning sure you know sure and she was educating yeah and so and she she didn't hurt right the monkey he was still good now he knows yeah yo don't do it yeah don't do that that's not allowed yeah and uh and i feel like we're doing a disservice to dogs when we don't well because you know you, you you get into terms and 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 words are very powerful so you know when you come up with a great term like positive only dog training um and then you call it science-based well science has been wrong a bunch of times right including the flat earth right and some people still believe it's flat but nonetheless there's been a lot of mistakes in science and the beautiful thing about science is it evolves but science-based dog training is not really science-based dog training because it ignores the four quadrant it ignores three out of the four it's 75 percent of science is ignored in science-based dog training we've proven dogs can learn by positive punishment right right? but but we've also proven that they can learn by positive reinforcement but why do we have to choose if and again i'm not a big science guy i don't like the whole quadrant i think it's very confusing to people um but you know bf skinner first of all was not a dog trainer and he's cited by more dog trainers than anybody else so here's a guy who had no idea how to train a dog probably couldn't get a dog through a bh Right. But yet all these dog trainers are citing this study. And this is a person who is putting, you know, rats in shuttle boxes and electrocuting them and proving this. But now they're taking one side of his argument saying this is doctrine, this is gospel, mm-hmm. but the other side isn't. So it's an extremely flawed argument for anybody right. with a half a brain. 
but, but I even see it now. Like I, I'm always like intrigued by like when when I get a, a trainer, a force free trainer, positive only, whatever, attack mm-hmm. me. I always go to their page mm-hmm. and I see what they're doing. Yeah. And you know what they're doing? They got a dog on a long line mm-hmm. in the middle where there's no there's no other distractions mm-hmm. and they're playing with their dog mm-hmm. and they're letting you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, well, that's not normal. That's mm-hmm. not what my clients are seeing. Sure. Yeah. So you know, so I can, yeah. I while I understand where you're coming from about you not wanting to correct the dog, yeah, but we're in completely different situations here. Like my dogs are completely different situations than yours. Now I'm not saying that with the right dog, with the right trainer, Mm -hmm. with the right, you can't make good training with positive Mm -hmm. only methods with the right, but there's certain dogs that don't fit that. And there's certain owners that for sure don't fit that. Yeah. So how do we deal with them? Well, you know, the, the, the problem is everybody thinks theirs is the only way, like everything I do and you do starts positive. Right. All my training, uh, I've had this saying since day one. I said, everything I do with the dog starts with a treat and a toy. Where it goes from there is totally up to the dog. Right. If I tell the dog to stay in the middle of the field and I come back and, and I give him a cookie and he stays there and I can walk a dog by, well, then he's learned. Yeah. Sadly, most dogs who have a predatory drive, because they are predators, right? We've kind of outbred the predator in a lot of dogs. But if we're just, if, if it's in there, if, if it has a predatory instinct and a rabbit runs by when I tell him to sit, the desire to chase that rabbit is greater than the desire for the piece of kibble. Right. Right. So now my thing is I had a Sharpe and a Belgian Malinois and a parrot and they all lived together. And my parrot would sit on the bed with my Sharpe and the Malinois. And people said, how'd you get him to do that? And I said, well, his desire to kill the bird was overridden by his fear of me killing him right so and now that's not doesn't mean i would ever kill him but it sounds ugly it, but but it is life is ugly i know i know but i'm bird. saying like somebody would easily flip that and be Go like ahead. oh he put fear into the dog that's why he's doing what he's doing yeah no, he's just teaching the dog how to but why know, is fear bad yeah like it's the not, reason I don't I, drive 100 miles an hour on the freeway a thousand percent is not you know what killed. i'm saying but the way they the words that they're using yeah. are like you know are things that trigger uh, people. But then so, just the word trigger, you know, we need to be able to be triggered. Right. You know, we're, we're really growing into a society of wimps in a lot of ways. Right. And when the, the proverbial, you know, what hits the fan, you're going to need some people to clean up the mess. Right. And those are not the people who are easily offended. You know, and that's one thing that, like I said, I've got no problem if you don't want to hire me as a dog trainer um, or if you don't like my way of dog training. But it works. Right. Um, it's 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 much more positive than the guy you're talking about online. Because I've seen these people with harnesses on their dogs and their dog pulling and not getting a clear signal for weeks and weeks of lessons. My dog is going to get a really clear picture really early on. And boundaries and structure is a really humane way to help an animal. And if you don't right. want to help an animal and you're putting your own ego and your own agenda in there and mm. calling yourself a purely positive person, you're not purely positive. You're very abusive because you're not giving a clear picture. Dogs function in black and white. I used to say this in my lectures. I said, dogs know black <laughs> and white. And if I put those two together and I walk in the middle, where am I walking? And everybody says gray. I said, no, there's no gray between black and white. It's a line. You're either walking on the black side or the white side. Right. And that's how dogs understand life. That's how every animal who cannot communicate through verbal means understands life. There's punishment and there's pleasure, right? That's it. If I go to another country, and I've gone to different countries where I didn't speak the language, and I would try to figure out how to communicate, and it was positive and negative. It was yes and no. You know this and you know that. Right. And that's how we start teaching dogs. We do this and we give them a cookie, and we do this and we don't give them a cookie. And if here's the thing, people don't like it. Okay, well, are you willing to take your beloved dog that you love as much as you love your guapo, I love my goofy or silly, um, are you willing to take that dog and put him in front of an aggressive dog and use your positive only methods? Right. Because I am, I've put my dog, I've put Goofy on the floor in a park without a leash in the middle of the park and I've walked an aggressive German Shepherd on him. He knows, he, he knows Robert's got this. Right. Right. So he's going to stay put. Now, this dog that I'm working, I need to control him because if he hurts my dog, first of all, that's not going to do him any good. And right. It's not going to do my dog any good. 
So you need to get those pictures across in a humane black and white manner because you cannot explain it verbally. You know, it's, it's, it's impossible. Right. That's good. Yeah, no, yeah. and I agree with you, thousand percent, man. Yeah. Uh, Raw, you got any questions for Robert? No, bro? man, I'm just enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did have a question. Um, so, your first experience with your sharp pay, would you say that that's where your career as a dog trainer started, or did it start once people from the veterinarian office started calling you for help? Um, well, I would say my experience with dogs, you know, really started when I was watching Mike train his his Doberman or anything like that. Um, uh, where it, I don't really know where it started. It's like really hard for me, even with my martial arts, to say where did it really start. It. Um, I, the reason I ask is because we have a team of what nine trainers, more than that, uh, like eleven, like I think. eleven, yeah. and I want to say eighty percent of them are below twenty five years old. Mm -hmm. I started training dogs professionally with Oscar at the age of thirty three. Mm -hmm. um, how old were you when you when, you, when how old were you when you know, when you consider yourself a trainer, a, a, professional. <laughs> a professional trainer, um, you, you know, I have a word of the, uh, an issue with the word professional, you know, like I'm a dog trainer. Yeah. You know, I think whenever you put professional before a word, it shows that there's a problem like professional photographer. Right. Yeah. Like there's no professional doctors. There's no oh, professional right, lawyers. You know yeah. what I mean? When you have to say I'm a professional dog trainer, what, what makes you a I guess I guess I just uh, like I, I take it like skateboarding. Like you become a pro when you get paid, get paid. Right. Right. So that's based, I think it's like, when did you first, I don't know when I, yeah, first, Oscar, we, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know when I first started getting paid yeah. as a dog trainer, yeah. honestly, but, reason uh, I somebody, ask is, okay, but look at somebody who does amazing, like competition stuff. They're professional dog trainers, but they're yeah. not getting paid. Yeah, that's got it. Right. That's exactly that's what point. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think just cause you get paid, you're a professional. I think you're just a paid dog trainer. You can say I'm a paid dog trainer. Right. Um, I just consider myself, I mean, I'm still evolving. I still, every single dog I put hands on for the first time, I start as a student of that dog. That's it. I want to study that dog. I want to know what are his needs, what are his challenges, and how can I most humanely and effectively help him get from point A to point B in the quickest amount of time? Because a dog only lives for 12 years, mm -hmm. right? So that's not fair for me to waste two years of that dog's life and thousands of dollars of a person's money to teach them something that I can teach them relatively quickly. Right. Now, do you also... A look at the owner and how they like how how they manage the dog and how mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. do you do you do you consider that when it comes to the training yeah it's a huge piece to, i mean right? the dynamics everything in life right you and your wife me and my wife you know me and my dog you and your dog there's a dynamic our friendship right we have an immense respect for each other um and it's based on how we interact with each other you know, if you don't have respect, you don't have something built up, you interact differently. But if that owner doesn't have a way of communicating or a way of, y y your dog must respect you. Right. Right. You're, and, and people always say, well, I want my dog to love me. I said, then make them respect you first. Because mm -hmm. children, you want them to love you first, then they will respect you. Dogs will never, ever go in that direction. They will respect you and they will love you. Because here's the equation. When I used to be a bodyguard, People kind of, you know, would want me to go hang out with them because they felt safe, mm -hmm. right? So we could go to really bad neighborhoods and I, I knew kind of what to watch for or I would, knew, would knew, know um, what to look out for. And if, if, the, if something happened, I, know, I would know what to do. Your dog doesn't know that much about you. He either knows he's safe with you or he's not safe with you. Most dogs, 90 plus percent of dogs that have aggression issues are doing it because they're insecure, Right. They're trying to protect you and themselves. If, if your dog knows that's the toughest mother I know, he's not going to be tough. Why? Why would he be tough? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem in the protection sports when you start by being too strong on the dog because then you squash the dog's... How many times do you see that, right? Mm -hmm. People put so much pressure on a dog when the dog's young that the dog grows up to be like... Uh, and I made the mistake with my dog, right? right? I didn't know good trainers like you when I started with 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 Goofy. We all know what happened. We talked mm -hmm. about it. I'm not going to say it publicly, but yeah. they put too much pressure on the dog, and and I put pressure on the dog. And so if my if Goofy went into the b blind to do a bark and hold, and I walked by, he was like, whoa, 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 whoa you know? Right. Do I, and and you don't want that. Right. The dog must be confident, right? And that's what I watch in your dogs. Your dogs are confident. That's what I watch in dogs, you know, of people that I really admire in the sports. Their dogs are confident, but 
you got to bring that in a certain way. A thousand percent. You know? Yeah. You, you got to be tactical or, you know, mm-hmm. plan out how you're going to do it in a way that is going to work for that dog. Yeah. And sometimes you'll open up, uh, you know, other little things can you, uh, you could cause other little issues doing it uh, the wrong way. You got to go back and fix those things and, you know, work yeah. through all that stuff. Yeah, that's why, man, I, that's why I love like protection work and everything, because mm-hmm. uh, especially competition, because it gives you a criteria where you got to train for. And then you yeah. run into these, you know, obstacles. You got to get sure. through it or whatever. But, yeah, um, it's a minefield. Yeah. Um, all right. So we do have some questions for you. All right. uh, from from our people out there, okay. our listeners, <laughs> um, let me get one and good one for you. Let me one that I think it's good. This one, this okay. one, uh, yeah. Uh, can you explain the difference? And I, I, I don't, I have no clue what they're talking about. So maybe you do because you've <laughs> talked about it. Maybe they know they've listened to you. Okay. Can you explain the difference between body and brain reactivity or aggressiveness? So I think what they're referring to is dogs that are reactive versus dogs that are aggressive. Got okay. I mean that that's kind of the way I read it. Okay. You know? Sometimes people have like people from other countries, so they don't say it right. But um, the, the the big oh I see I see what you're saying. Now. You know yeah, I got it, got it, got it. Right, yeah. body aggressiveness, and and so a dog that's reactive. You know, all dogs are reactive in a way. Right, we want we're all reactive. They're going to react right? a certain way, whether it be a positive right reaction or a negative. Right, yeah. but when we say, and this is a big trigger word in rescue, like they'll say, "Oh, he's not dog aggressive; he's dog reactive." Well, based on his reaction, he might become aggressive. Right, right? and then we have to deal with defensive or ag- off- offensive aggression. Right, mm-hmm. a dog that's defensively aggressive is just trying to get away, but is a lot more dangerous right. because if he's cornered, he's going to kill than a dog who's dominant or offensively aggressive. So it really goes into um, how we would approach that dog in training. And, you know, again, a dog that's reactive, we're going to assume for the sake of the conversation that the dog is more than likely more fear-based aggressive, is a little insecure. Mm -hmm. We build immense amount of confidence in the dog because crushing a dog that's already negative and it's already defensive, you can't, Either, either that or like it could be frustration, right? Frustration, frustration sure. and that's getting him to react a certain yeah. way, barking and doing all that. Right, tight leashes and yeah. stuff like that. Aggressiveness, I mean, I feel like the dogs that I have seen that are aggressive react, a, it's a very different look. Mm-hmm. Uh, one that I recall, and I maybe, I don't know, was uh, this bull terrier, and she was very quiet, mm-hmm. very quiet, but very intense going forward, like looking at the dog in yeah. a way like, she really wanted to kill it. kill yeah. kill this dog. Uh, what what other ways can you that you know have you seen dogs be aggressive that you're like oh yeah that's an aggressive dog. Well, I, I, I always say still water runs deep. Still, can you explain that? Still water runs deep. So in other words, like if you look at like waves and stuff, waves happen because there's there's a, it's running up against something. Like if you go in the ocean and it's really still, it's probably really deep. So when I see an animal, like a person, like a guy who comes up to me and is like yelling in my face and I swearing see. at me, I, I I really don't worry much about that, you know. But if somebody's real quiet and they're just looking at you with that, you know, they're not blinking, you know, yeah. they're staring at you, um, that worries me a little bit more. So a dog that I can't read, a dog that's real still and real quiet and really like, you know, uh, well-eyed, like looking at you. That would worry me a little Got bit more it. than a dog that's barking like crazy or lunging or right. growling or whatever. I like it. <laughs> All right. This is a good one. Okay. Uh, and I could I could almost answer this one for you. What would you suggest doing to help solve some of the problems in L.A. shelter system? you got to buy his program. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it. No, you know, so what, what do you think? Well, you know, the problem one is 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 pet overpopulation, right? Backyard breeders and all that stuff. Um, we don't really have enough people who are really training their dogs. You know, I mean, right. all, whether it's online training, in-person training, whatever, even if you go to Petco with your dog, you're doing something with your dog, get involved, make, make being, and that's, what's cool. When I hear you guys have young trainers, that's why I like when I hear things about young people in the sports, because it gets them active. We need to build this compassion, just like we need to build bridges between cultures like black, white, gay, straight, all these other things. We need to build bridges between um, dogs and people. Like how do we get a dog in a home? Like recidivism is the number one, one of the number one things affecting dogs going back. And like they'll get adopted, 
pandemic, right? All the shelters are empty. Right. Post pandemic, all the shelters are full. Right? Because people have this kind of disposable mentality about dogs. Right. Like to me, I would rather die than give up my dog. I would live in my car rather than give up my dog. I've never given up a dog. And I took a Sharpe out of the shelter one time that was horribly aggressive. It attacked my other Sharpe um, and wanted to kill it. Like it was a, it, mm-hmm. nobody could take this dog. It bit. My one friend was going to take it and he bit her. It bit, it bit everybody. They, they couldn't feed the dog. And they called me that one day. It was just before, February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day. Like, I forget what year it was. Um, and they said, can you take this dog? And I said, yeah. And I took him. And I, I never gave him up. And he died. He died in my arms. Four months later, he had some kind of a brain issue. But um, we just need to, one, become more responsible dog owners. We need to, they need to crack down on backyard breeders. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, this is every time somebody says, oh, you got a purebred dog. What about all those rescue dogs? Well, I, I never put a dog in the, in the shelter. Right. And I've rescued dogs. And I bought dogs and I got no problem with anyone who does either. Mm-hmm. But if you're going, you know, on, you know, supporting a puppy mill or some backyard breeder, then I got a problem with it. But the shelters, you know, the shelters need to do their job in instilling more <coughs> programs that train dogs because a trained mm-hmm. dog is a much easier dog to get adopted out thousand percent. than a, a wild dog. And yeah, cow. No, I think that what you were doing, you know, with the shelter dogs, I think that's amazing. And if anybody out there uh, wants to do something like that and you need to, if you, you know, if you want to learn how to train and, and you're going to put some time into shelters like that, and you're going to bring out a, a shelter dog that you need help with. Uh, I would be more than happy to to help you out. So oh, I'm just putting cool. that out there because um, I think that I, I I have been thinking about like, man, what are some ways that I could like, you know, kind of mm-hmm. give back or whatever. And I think that's an amazing way. So if trainers out there listening, if you can get out there and help your local dogs that nobody is seeing. Uh, you know, especially us that we're into like social media yeah. and everything like that's a good opportunity. Yeah. There's to get a lot of dogs sh- seen. The problem with shelters is they're really limited. Like you, you're no shelter is going to let you bring an e-collar and a prong collar. in. I mean, you're very limited. So, you know, shelters need to open their, their minds about that. Mm. Um, because what happens is the, the purely positive crowd. And again, I'm not here to talk to slam on that. Yeah. Right. I, there's a ton of like Susan Garrett's a great trainer. Uh, my wife is 90% positive, great trainer. This Melissa Anning is a, f- a friend of hers, this agility, amazing trainer. But they know their limits, right? They're not going to take a really aggressive dog out of the shelter. So you, we need to kind of bridge that gap. And, and, right. and, you know, here, you can take these dogs, we'll take these dogs, let's work together. Right. Plenty of, plenty yeah. of dogs that need help. Yeah. All right. Um, we got, you, you, you could pick one from these two, and then, you know, it'll be our... Our last one, because okay. I know you, I know your no, your time is valuable. Let's do both of them. If All right, cool. Enough to write it. Let's do it. All right. Tips to giving a dog with bite history a fair life. Structure. You know, everything comes everything comes with structure. Like you know, I mean, I with dogs that have that kind of issues. I think the biggest mistake people make with dogs that have bite history is they right away want to get the dog out in an environment, and then they want people giving the dog treats. Right. That's there's no bigger mistake than a dog that has an issue with people and then people getting in that dog's face. Right. So as a trainer, my thing is to decompress the dog like everybody around you doesn't even pay attention to you. I love that. They don't put any pressure on you. And and the only person who's going to give you cookies is me. Right. Right. And then after weeks of this, I have people dropping treats. So there's no pressure. I think dogs with bite history don't do well with pressure they can't understand, right? The pressure of me not allowing them to interact and pressure of me telling somebody else don't go near the dog makes it fair to the dog. Then I can explain to the dog, you have no reason to bite. But if somebody's getting right in his face, I can't correct the dog because, you know, I haven't set up a fair structure for the dog. So basically what you're saying is first you got to change the dog's mindset about people, like Mm -hmm. meaning there's no reason for you to interact with this person. Mm -mm. And that is our job as owners, letting the other person know, like, yo, stay away from my dog, right? Mm -hmm. And once the dog is comfortable and he knows the situation, Mm -hmm. now you could counter, not counter condition, but I mean, you could let him know, hey, people are good because every time somebody walks by, they're going to drop something for you and it's going to become a positive association. Now, even then, I still wouldn't allow people to get so close, but at least you're working towards getting that dog a little more comfortable with people. But it's the same thing people do with dog reactive dogs, right? They right away want to take it. I had a client who had one. She says, you know, can we just put them on the e-collar and put them in front of a, uh, the fence at the dog park? And I'm like, well, that's the worst thing to do. Yeah. You know, like for me, a dog, aggressive dog, 
First of all, I don't think in socializing a dog, it needs to be friends with other dogs. It must accept <clears throat> other dogs, right? Like you don't have to like every person you see in the street. That right. person could just have a face that you just want to punch. But not punching them, right, is what really makes you a better person. So if I teach my dog, okay, you know, there's a dog there, you're with me. There's a dog there, you're with me. Um, we'll teach my dog, like my, like Goofy is super social, right? He doesn't, has no problems. But I never let him meet all these dogs when he was young. He was always coming back to me. So he always thought, well, no dog is going to bother me. And he wouldn't run up to another dog. When you try to over-socialize dogs, they start running up to other dogs. And then they're going to run up to one bad dog. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to get in a fight. That's, yeah. That's good advice. Uh, what is the best uh, uh, best approach to meeting a shelter dog? Neutrality, like let the dog check you out. I mean, I always because I I, I could correct a dog, I could protect myself if something were to happen. Um, I would always when I went to the kennel, and this is a different story. If the person is actually talking about adopting a dog or working at a shelter, it's a big difference. Um, if you're going to actually be taking dogs out of a kennel you need to know that technique, how to get dogs out of a kennel. And there's, there's a special technique for it. But to me, it always starts with dropping a couple of cookies in the, in the kennel, seeing the dog, and the dog going, okay, this guy's fair, and then noosing him. Now, when somebody is going to adopt a shelter dog, and this is a huge piece, the biggest mistake that I've seen, not, never on my watch, but I've seen people bring their kids in there, and the first thing they do whenever anybody meets a dog, they start petting the dog. They got it's on a tight leash, overstimulating, it, it. overstimulating, trying to kiss it. Like nobody in the world has ever been bitten on the face by a dog that didn't put their face close, unless it's a Great Dane, right? Unless it's right. a big dog. Um, generally, you put your, like people. You, you know the number one place people are bit by rattlesnakes is in the face because they pick the rattlesnake up or they get close to it. It's just really stupid. So when people do, or on the hands from trying to pick them up, and people get bit on the hands and they get bit on the face by dogs. So um, just just let, especially a shelter dog, it needs to decompress. Like right. if you first bring the dog home, just put it in a crate, let it feed it, hand feed it. Just be chill. Just let it, yeah. let it decompress. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and it, it just, it makes us feel good petting mm -hmm. the dog. Yeah. You know? But like how you see my puppy right now, I give them, no attention mm -hmm. when I'm talking to somebody. I try to, except for the, I'm not even going to mention it yesterday. I'll tell you off camera. Okay. <laughs> but anyways, I, I want him to chill out, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, ugh. anyways. He's yeah. a great dog. Yeah, he's a good dog. I like but him. I want to make sure that, you know, our interactions are when, like, he, he understands that when I start talking to somebody, mm -hmm. he just lays down. Yeah. And he's doing it. And I think naturally. Uh, the breeder said that he was like that, kind of uh, like laid back, and then, yeah. So I'm like, yo, that's what I want. Yeah. You know? So, uh, anyways, uh, Ro, you got anything else for Robert? No. Hey, man, <laughs> uh, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you oh, coming out you. here. And yeah. uh, why don't we tell everybody where they? I'm sure everybody already knows about Robert, <laughs> but if in case you have not heard, where can they find all your stuff? And just, just my site. I mean, everything leads off my site, robertcabral.com. They can find my YouTube, my my course, my. Um, lessons, my training lessons, and all my social media stuff. Awesome. Hey, man, we really appreciate you. Uh, first off, what you're doing for the the community, I think, uh, you know, for the for the dog training culture is big, and a lot of people look up to you. I look up to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, man, you got anything else to add? Uh, no. Um, just a quick funny story. When I first met Robert, I didn't know he was a dog trainer. <laughs> he was out in Irwindale, and I was like, oh, hey, my name's Roel. Uh, oh, my name's Robert. Oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a dog trainer. <laughs> and, and I Googled like, I looked him up later, and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. He's not just a dog trainer. Yeah, yesterday we're there with the team, right? And I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, we got Robert coming out. You know, and he's like, uh, one, one of them was like, Robert Cabral's going to be out there? <laughs> yeah bro can i go over there and hang out I'm like yeah bro come meet him <laughs> so he might be here in a little All bit right, cool. but uh cool. anyways uh if you guys uh we we have recently changed our uh channel what what, what is what is it now uh, created a new channel separate from oscar mora canines so we yeah have so what was happening was i was having like other people not being able to find my stuff mm -hmm. and so we wanted to create something a little bit more for uh like elevated canine media which is going to be different you know what is it? Blog, blog, vlogs, yeah, vlogs, and, uh, uh, training days, and just, then a podcast know, and all that. So, uh, we started a channel just for that. So make sure you guys check out 
Right now it's Elevated Canine Podcast. We're gonna change it to Elevated Canine Media. Yep. Um. So we'll we'll get we'll put some links uh, on on Oscar's page and then through Instagram you'll slowly start seeing things transition. Yep. And today's uh, episode was brought to you by Underdog, which Robert has a vest. You yeah, know, the best vest. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> you guys could go pick it up at Underdog U N D R. U N D R D O G. It's on your shirt. <laughs> Dot U S. <laughs> go check it out, guys. And then, uh, yeah, see you guys on the next one. Tony. Awesome. Let's get it. This that go and get it. With no hesitation. This that never quit.